Good to have Brother Russell, Sister Lisa with us this morning. And it's always a pleasure to see him. But it's especially a pleasure when you get to be in church with him. Amen. 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 We'll be in Acts chapter 2 this morning. Verses 25 through 28. And although I know this is a Peter's day of Pentecost message, we're going to pull something specifically out of this message that he talks about. Very interesting here. And that's joy. He talks a lot about joy in this message, especially in the psalm that he uh, quotes, he talks about here, we see a lot, or refers back to, we see a lot about joy. Amen. And joy is, is should be a result of knowing God. Joy should be a result of knowing God. I remember um, Brother Tom Bates one time gave a definition of what joy should be. He said joy should be, or what it is, is unshakable confidence in God. That's, that, that's, that's our so, source of joy. It's unshakable confidence in God. Verse number 25, Acts chapter 2. Peter says, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face. For he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Therefore did my heart rejoice and my tongue was glad. Moreover also my flesh shall rest in hope. Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thine holy one to see corruption. Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. Thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Amen. So thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now, sometimes we talk about, and, and rightfully so, the difference between happiness and joy. You know, we make the, the distinction that happiness is when something is happening and, and it makes us happy. And, you know, you, you, know you, have a, you, you, you have a good day at work, it makes you happy. You have a bad day at work, it makes you sad. You know, those, sometimes we make that distinction. But joy, on the other hand, is, is unshakable. It's there. It's always it's a result of knowing God and having a relationship with God and seeing Him clearly before us. That is the result of joy. So even in times of sorrow and suffering, we can experience joy. But then oftentimes in the Bible, we'll see joy and happiness as convertible terms. And that's, that's because the the distinction was a little different during this during the time that this language was was being used but we everybody wants to be happy whenever we, we think of the sense of, of, of happiness and wanting to to be have, a, have an idea of satisfaction everybody wants that and there's nothing inherently wrong with wanting to be happy Wanting to feel good, wanting to have joy, wanting to, to, to be in a place where you experience goodness in your life. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Augustine said that I am not alone in this desire for happiness. We all want happiness. He says, nor are there only a few who share it with me. He said, it's a common, general aspect of humanity to seek happiness. That's why we do often much what we do. As you, 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 you have friends because... You, you, you get happiness from your friends, your family, you know, bring us joy. You know, uh, something is not wrong just because it's a source of happiness. We do things, we go places, we have experiences. I love going to church. Church makes me happy. I, I enjoy it. I went to church the other night. The, the preacher, he, uh, he, he left me in tears, but I was happy. I enjoyed it. It was a good time in a sense. The serving God. You know, last year I got to go to India. I'm getting ready to go back here in just a few weeks. It was a hard trip. There was a lot of hardness about that. There was some, we had a lot of difficulty, especially on the way home. But I was happy to get to do that. So happiness is something that, 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 that satisfies us. It's something that we seek. We can almost explain all of human behavior as a search for happiness or satisfaction. Although most of that searching is in the wrong places. Now, this is where the dichotomy begins, is whenever we begin to search for happiness in the wrong places, we begin to search for satisfaction in places that only brings temporary sinful satisfaction. That's one of Satan's most uh, successful lies, is that God wants everyone to be miserable. And you know, oftentimes, 
you'll see, uh, especially in pop culture and movies and things like Christianity, especially, is always presented or depicted as some kind of miserable existence of someone trying to, you know, impose some kind of uh, unlivable rules on someone else. And that's that's a lie of the devil. But even in a casual reading of the Word of God reveals that God is a being who has great joy himself and that everyone who comes to know him enters into the only true and lasting joy possible. We see that all through Scripture, that joy is an attribute of God. He is, he is a God of joy. He has joy. He finds joy and pleasure in his people, in his Son. There is joy in that, and he is the source of joy for all those who know him. The Psalms, you read through the book of Psalms, it overflows with joy and gladness. Jesus told the disciples that he spoke to them, that his joy would be in them, and their joy would be made full. In John 15 11, he goes through this whole thing with joy, and that them having the joy in him. The fruit that the Spirit produces in the believer is first love, then joy. We see it all through the Word of God. Joy, joy, joy is prominent. God has promised eternal lasting joy for us in heaven. The Puritans, they had it right whenever they said the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. That was their motto. That was why they said that man existed. The chief end, the whole reason that we're here, living, breathing, having the opportunity to come into this relationship and knowledge of Christ now today is that way we, that we may jo enjoy God forever and that we may glorify Him with our lives. John Piper, one of his, he, he sums up his whole ministry, his whole thing by saying this. He says, God is most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. That's the motto of the Desire of God ministry that uh, Dr. John Piper heads up. That God is most glorified whenever our satisfaction, whenever our joy and our hope and our peace and our gladness is all wrapped up in God. We glorify Him in being satisfied with Him. Isn't that wonderful? That He is most glorified in our lives when we are most satisfied in Him. And that's not... Don't mistake that for some kind of prosperity gospel uh, uh, misdirection. That's we're we're satisfied in God as we suffer with God, as we as we give ourselves in ministry, and we give ourselves to be to be sent and be spent and be poured out and broken and before Him. We are we are showing that He is our satisfaction, not things, not temporal uh, uh, comforts, but that Christ alone is our source of joy and satisfaction. And by living that life, we prove that and we. Glorify Him in that. So rather than discouraging us from seeking joy and gladness, the Bible rather exhorts us to seek it, but to seek it in the right place. God Himself is the source of all joy and gladness, and if we seek joy in God, we'll find eternal satisfaction. We can, the satisfaction that we will enjoy throughout the ages of eternity, we can have it now. We can get a hold of it now. It will only be multiplied and we will only see things more clearly as eternity goes on. We cross over into that next slide. But we can get a hold of that source of joy now. Now, in this, in his sermon here on the day of Pentecost, Peter cites uh, Psalm 16, 8-11. And he applies it to Jesus Christ. Where he says, for David says of him. So Peter is arguing that this psalm in which the author uh, says that God will not um, allow his body to undergo decay did not ultimately apply to David. Because he said, makes the point, who David, he did overco uh, undergo decay. David did die. We, they had his sepulcher. They knew where he, where he died. But rather, as a prophet, David was writing about his descendant, Jesus, the Messiah, who God would raise from the dead. That while on the level, on, on one level the psalm did apply to David, on another level it applied to only Christ and Christ alone. This is why David could be referred to as a prophet in the Old Testament nobody ever referred to David as a prophet he wasn't known as a prophet he was known as a king he was known as a warrior he was known as a psalmist he was known as a man who loved God but he was never known as a prophet until we get to the New Testament and in light of Christ they look back on the writings in the book of Psalms and they see that so much of it pointed to this Messiah and that's what Peter he's bringing that point out right here David as a prophet was not talking about 
himself whenever he wrote this, but he was talking about Christ. It can only apply to him. Now, what we have to see is that the subject of the person, or the subject of the psalm is the person Jesus Christ, who is full of joy and gladness. Verse 25 says, My heart was glad and my tongue exalted. Moreover, my flesh also will abide in hope. Verse 28 goes on to say, You will make me full of gladness with your countenance. Now, Peter, in his quotation of this, he left off the last part of the psalm. Psalm 16 and 11 says, In, in thy presence is fullness of joy, and at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. Now, so since Jesus was, was full of God's joy and gladness, if we're, if, if we're growing, growing to be like Christ, we'll be growing in God's joy and gladness as well. While true joy and gladness come from God, our text breaks it into three sources. Joy and gladness comes from knowing God's presence. It comes from being conformed to God's holiness. And from the hope of God raising up our bodies so that we can dwell with Him eternally. These are the three sources that this particular uh, passage of Scripture, the psalm that... that, that, that Peter is quoting from, it breaks it into these three categories, these three sources. Joy and gladness come from, first of all, continually knowing God's presence. A continual seeking, a continual desire, a continual uh, uh, endeavor to know God, to be with God, to experience God, to walk in His presence, to pray through as it is. Brother Clinton, he said, you need to pray through every day. Don't wait till the next time we have revival to pray through. He said, make it a point in your life, an endeavor to daily get along with God. Pray to you experience His presence. Pray to you know that you're there with Him. Pray that you come to that place where His presence is real where the joy of God is made real to you. Pray through every day. Make the joy and gladness come from that continual knowing of God's presence. Acts 2, 2 and 25, he says again, For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. Now, Peter is, uh, of course, here uh, citing the Greek translation. Now, at, there was, at this time, there was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. Because so many people spoke Greek, they, 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 they called, it was the Septuagint, a lot of these guys, they, they, they put this thing together, it was, a, it was a Greek translation of the Old Testament. And judging by the, the translation, and what this word is translated from here, Peter is citing the Greek translation of Psalm 16. The Hebrew reads, I've set the Lord continually before me. Now, it, it implies a deliberate action. A deliberate action. The psalmist was deliberately setting the Lord before him. He was deliberately bringing himself to that place where he is focusing on God. He's praying. He's seeking God. He's on his mind. He's uh, purposely, deliberately setting God before him. Now, to have the Lord at his right hand signifies protection. Advocates would sit on the, on the right hand of their clients to defend them in court. Bodyguards would stand at the right hand of the one that they're guarding in order to protect them. They could protect them with the shield with their, their left hand and still have the right hand free to, to fight with. It, 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 it signifies protection. It, it signifies someone who is there to watch over, to protect, to advocate, to stand in the place of. It, 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 it exemplifies that. Joy and gladness exemplified in Jesus. Jesus. Now, at, at first it may seem strange to look to Jesus as this great example of joy and gladness since he was known as a man of sorrow who bore our griefs. Now, it, it's also ironic that the, the shortest verse in the gospel is John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. But the shortest verse in the epistles is 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16, which says rejoice always. So we, we see the, the, these two things. Jesus, a man of sorrow, he wept when he seen the brokenness and the burden of, of, of Martha and Mary and the other Jews when Lazarus was dead and they thought it was beyond hope that it could ever be uh, or resuscitated or, or brought back to life. He, he, he wept at that moment. But then Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 5 and 16 to always rejoice. Now these two verses are not contradictory. Almost it may seem that way at first glance. Uh, biblical joy and gladness do not deny sorrow and grief. Now, in the garden, Jesus told the disciples that his soul was deeply grieved to the point of death. 
And Hebrews 12 and 2 says that Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, endured the cross. Now the cross itself was not joyful. There was no joy in the cross itself. But there was great joy ahead of the cross. The result, the result of the cross would bring great joy. He endured the suffering and the shame and the ridicule and the betrayal and, 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 and the mockery. He endured that before the joy that was before Him. Because there was, there, there, there was reward in what would be gained by the cross. So biblically, joy and gladness are, are the deep undercurrent or the fountain in God that sustained the believer in and through times of sorrow and grief. Jesus knew the sorrow and the grief that would be in, in what was going to happen at the crucifixion. And not just, the, not just the physical aspects of it, but the spiritual aspects of it. He knew the, the, the sorrow, the grief, the suffering that it would involve, but he also knew the joy of the other side. Now, I can't talk about joy in, in sorrow and grief without talking, you know, giving the testimony of, of Connie Elza. Now, I, I don't know, I've told this different times here, but it, you know, it fits so well. Whenever her little girl, Tommy Lou, was killed in a four-wheeler accident, it was, it was, you know, shattering to this family. I mean, you know, it was heartbreaking. And to everyone who knew him, it, was, it, it broke the heart of our church. I mean, our, everyone who knew that they just grieved along with this family whenever their little girl died. And a few years before that, I had a cousin who had died in a different way. And his family wasn't Christians at the time. They wasn't serving the Lord. And it almost destroyed this family when this young man died. He was 16 when he died. And it almost destroyed them. It broke their hearts. And we had went to visit Sister Connie Tommy, whenever the little girl, Tommy Lou, died. And uh, there was a lot of people there at their house, and she was sitting in a chair, and she was just weeping, and people there trying to comfort and the best they could. And this lady, whose son had died a, a year before, she came in, and she fell down before, and she told her that her life would never know joy anymore. You'll never know joy. You'll never know happiness. Your life is over, and it's just, you know, very bleak what this lady had to say, because that was, that was her experience. That was her life. That's what she was going through. That's why she was suffering at that time. And some folks, they got this lady up and they helped her out. And the only thing Sister Connie could say was that she doesn't know the Lord. She doesn't know the Lord. You know, she, in this darkest moment, the sorrow was real beyond anything she'd ever experienced, I'm sure. And here's someone saying that this sorrow is it. This is your life now. This is all you have. This is all you have. But she, she seen, even in that moment of her darkest time, she seen where real, the, the difference in her own life and this individual's, that she did not know the true source of joy. Right. Joy wasn't wrapped up in another person. Amen. As much joy as we gain from our children, our families, our loved ones, that's not our source of joy. That's not it. The source is in Christ. The source is always in Christ. If I want to have, if I want to know real joy, if I want to be who I need to be, if I want to love my family the way I'm supposed to love my family, my focus, my joy, my world and life will be wrapped up in Christ and Him alone. If we want a picture of biblical joy and gladness, we have to look at the life of Jesus. Though he went through times of great difficulty and sorrow, especially as he bore the sins, uh, bore our sins on the cross, he also had times of great joy and gladness. Throughout Luke chapter 15, Jesus emphasizes the great joy in heaven. Uh, he says that, the, that all the angels rejoice over a single sinner coming to repentance. But we see the joy of the Father when the prodigal son returns home. In Luke chapter 10, we see Jesus greatly rejoicing in the Holy Ghost over God's sovereign grace in the lives of the apostles. Jesus told the disciples that He wanted His joy to be made full in them. And although He acknowledged that they would be sorrow, He never told the disciples anything different 
He said there will be sorrow. There will be suffering. He said that if they hated me, they're going to hate you worse. He never told them anything different. But he did say, he did acknowledge that when he was crucified, and he also promised that they would, uh, when, when they saw him alive, they would again have great joy and they would rejoice. So the Bible doesn't deny uh, the times of sorrow and grief, but it does. It does say that there will be times of joy in overcoming those, those times of sorrow. There'll be joy because we rest in the sovereign God and His certain promise to every believer that there can be joy in times of suffering. There can be joy in times of sorrow. Joy and gladness result from the continual cultivating of God's presence in our lives. Continually cultivating His presence. Continually seeking God. Continually having Him before us. Now, if, if we're not seeking God, if we're not cultivating, as it is, His presence in our lives, when we come to those times of sorrow, we come to those times of suffering, the joy is going to seem so uh, much further away. The time is going to be much bleaker. It's going to be much darker. It's going to be harder to get a hold and be sustained by that joy that Christ offers us if we're not cultivating His presence in our life. If I'm not praying, if I'm not seeking God, if I'm not reading His Word, if I'm not re maintaining this relationship with God in those times of darkness and hopelessness, it's going to be harder to experience the joy of God. I've, um, I've explained this before as... Uh, preemptive praying almost. You know, um, I've heard people, older folks say, stay prayed up. You know, most of us heard, here have heard that term before. Stay prayed up, prayed up, prayed up, stay prayed up. That's what it's talking about. Stay prayed up. If you're praying now, you're ready for tomorrow. If you're not praying now, you're, 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 you're sowing to the flesh as it is. You know, whenever during the, the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus brought Peter, James, and John with him. He tells, he stops and he says, you all pray. Stay here and pray. He goes a little further, prays alone. He comes back and they're all asleep. He wakes them up again. Pray, pray that you're not in the temptation. Pray, 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 pray. He goes back, comes back a third time, they're asleep again. Sleep on. They had the opportunity to be praying. Now we know when the trial comes up, they all fell miserably. The Bible says they all forsook him and fled. To one degree or another, they all failed. Even his trusted inner circle as it was, Peter, James, and John, they failed him just as well as everyone else. And Peter, of course, is the most well-known failure of the three. But the, the fact is, they had the opportunity to be praying at that time. Jesus instructs them to pray. You're getting ready to go into a trial. You're getting ready to be hardness. You're getting ready to suffer. You're getting ready to, 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 to experience deep sorrow. Pray. And we see the result. If we pray now, we can be ready then. Amen. 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 David said of Jesus in Psalm 16 and 8, I have set the Lord always before me. Because He is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Jesus lived each moment aware of the Father's presence. He never lived unto Himself. The, the only time He did not know the presence was at that awful moment on the cross when He cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When He was forsaken on our behalf, the only moment he did not know the presence of God. This is the key to joy. This is the key to gladness. Daily seeking to be in God's presence. Then when we go through those trials, we'll not lose our joy. Because God is with us. Amen. The second aspect of, of the joy presented here in this particular scripture is joy and gladness comes from being conformed to God's holiness. Now this is a this, this is very opposite of what we see oftentimes. Oftentimes, uh, holiness as it is looks like just mourning and sorrowful and no joy, grim, uh, fruitless, lifeless. It's always, you know, by the opponents of holiness, it's, it just looks like this. It looks like denying yourself any aspect of joy that you could be holy. And we know that's not true. That's not it. Holiness is, is not just an action of denying yourself pleasure. We're, we don't become holy by denying ourselves joy. It doesn't make us any holier than anyone else. Uh, Hebrews 1 and 9 says, Thou hast 
loved righteousness and hated iniquity. Therefore God, even thy God, has anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. Now note how righteousness and gladness go together in the scripture. Again, like you said, Satan, he always... Uh, it's always a lie. He always takes the truth and wants to pervert it into a lie. Here he, he perpetrates another great lie. He tries to make us think that real happiness is found in sin. That's the only time we can be happy. That's the only time we can be free. That's the only time we can have joy and pleasure is in sin. Whereas holiness is always presented as dull and dead and lifeless. That God's word teaches that holiness and happiness are inseparably bound together. Sin may give momentary pleasures. There's no one denies that. There's momentary pleasure in sin. The Bible says that you know Moses he didn't enjoy sin for a season, but he endured the the, the shame of Christ, as it was said. But uh, sin has momentary pleasures, but it will always bring destruction and death. Now, clearly, a person living in sin cannot uh, be happy in God's presence. It's impossible. We cannot be happy and have joy in the presence of God if we're living in sin. If, 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 the Bible says that, that men love darkness and want to hide from God, who is light, because their deeds are evil. As we, we, that's why we withdraw from God. It's because we think that there's, there, that there's some pleasure in sin and it ends up being broken emptiness. Uh, uh, sorrow and sadness. And the, the, the most grim thing that I see is people who are bound by sin, who are running from God, who are hiding from God. There's no joy, there's no, there's no peace in that life. Whenever we are running from God, hiding in the darkness because we don't want that thing to be exposed, we don't want to come to grips with what we are. Whenever Jonah disobeyed God, he tried to run from God's presence. We know that he failed miserably in that endeavor. But he, whenever he was wrong, whenever he was in sin. He didn't run to the place where the Bible says there is fullness of joy, but he ran to a place to try to hide and escape, to hide what he was, to hide his rebellion, to leave the light. He looked for the dark because his deeds had become evil. And he didn't want to face God. So the only way that we can know true joy that comes from God's presence is is to know that our sins are forgiven through faith in Jesus Christ and to be walking in obedience to Christ. That's where true joy is. As we are shed and, and, and set free from the bondage of sin, walk in the light of Christ, we can understand and know and experience the true joy of the presence of God. Our text in Acts 2 and 28 reads, Thou hast made known to me the ways of life. He, the, the psalmist had seen that in this experience of God and walking with God and obedience to God, that he had it, been uh, revealed to the ways of life, true life, been set free from death, been set free from sin. We don't know what it is to really live. We don't know what it is to really live until we've been born again. And any person who's truly been born again will tell you the same thing. No matter what they experience in life, no matter how rich, how successful they may have been in, in, in the life of sin, they really come to know what true joy, what true life is once we have been born again. Now, this refers to God's path of righteousness, whenever he's talking in, here in Acts 2 and 28, uh, that, that lead to true life, eternal life, that begins now. The one who lives for sinful desires is on the way that leads to destruction. And, and, and great is that path, the wide path. Now, the one who puts to death the, the sinful deeds of the flesh are set free from that and are put on the path of righteousness, which leads to eternal life. True joy is found in being set free from sin, not in the indulgence of sin. True freedom and liberty is found in putting to, to death the deeds of the flesh and not indulging the flesh. Psalm 51, David writes, Restore to me the joy of your salvation. We know that this is whenever uh, he, wrote, he writes this after the prophet Nathan had come to him and revealed his sin uh, of, of adultery and murder. And he comes to the Lord. He writes Psalm 51 and this line, Restore to me 
the joy of your salvation. He had found himself estranged from God because of his sin. He'd been divided. His relationship was, was, was not where it was supposed to be. There was a division. There was something between him. There was a wedge that was driven between him and his God because of his sin and his plea to God. He, the, the thing that mattered most to him was the restoration of this relationship because in that relationship with God is where he found his joy. That's where the joy that David experienced and wrote about was in was in in this, this uh, relationship with God, He says, all oh, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. Bring me back in the right relationship. He says, cast me not away from thy presence. He wants to be there. He's seen that everything that mattered was in Christ and in this relationship with God. Everything that mattered was in this place. He wasn't concerned with the, um, being in trouble for breaking the rules. He wasn't concerned with losing the kingdom. He wasn't concerned with losing position or the reputation like Saul was whenever his sin was revealed to him. He was concerned with the relationship with his God because that was the place the source of all joy, the source of all life and gladness was in his God and in that relationship. Whenever we sin, whenever we rebel against God, that should be our chief concern is bending the relationship we have with Him. I'm not worried about getting in trouble. I'm not worried about the chastisement that I may experience. I'm not, I'm not going to worry about the results of my sin, the consequences in this life that I may, may face because of them. I need to be concerned with getting this relationship right with God. That's the source of joy. That's everything. Joy and gladness come also from the certain hope of God's raising our bodies so that we can dwell eternally with Him. Amen. You know, last weekend was Easter. We talked a lot about resurrection, regeneration. And that's one of the sources of joy. One of the sources of the sustaining joy that we experience and we enjoy as we know God, we walk with Him, is that we believe this promise. We hold to this promise. We know that it's true that we will be raised with Him eternally. Acts 2 and 27 says, Because thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither will thou suffer the Holy One to see corruption. And we can rejoice because we have... That certain hope, that certain hope, that because Jesus was raised, even so, we will be raised when he returns. Now, if, if we didn't have the fact that Jesus raised from the dead, it would be much harder for us to get a hold of this joy, of this promise. You see, the, the, the Jewish people, they, they believed in resurrection. They never experienced, they never had any idea it was going to happen like it happened with Jesus, but they believed that there would be a resurrection. Remember when Jesus is talking to Martha again, and he says, your brother is going to rise again. And she says, well, I know, Lord, on the last day that he'll rise again. You see, that was a common belief. You know, that, that was a, a division between the Sadducees and the Pharisees. The Sadducees didn't believe in resurrection. The Pharisees did. Remember, whenever Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, he, you know, Paul was, he was a, a pretty savvy guy sometimes. He pulled some, some good stunts, and this is one of them. And they're there, and they're getting ready to, 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 to uh, stone him and, and, and kill him. And these Roman authorities, they come out like, what's going on? He's like, uh, well, we're, we're arguing over the resurrection. These people over here, they believe in the resurrection, and I'm with them, and they don't believe in the resurrection. So they, they, he takes the focus off of him, and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they start fighting among each other over the resurrection. So Paul kind of uses that to kind of slide out of that trouble there for a second. But the resurrection was a, something that they believed in. They were looking for it. They, 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 they expected it to happen at the last day, like Martha tells Jesus. And Jesus tells Martha, he said, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the source of this. And, and of course, he, he validated all of that in his own resurrection. So we have this, and of course, you know, we, we talk about the historical aspects of this resurrection. It's amazing that here we have, we have this resurrection, and, and the, the, even the, 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 the chief priests, the Pharisees, the ones who had put Jesus to death, they knew about the resurrection. They didn't never deny the empty tomb. They just come up with a lie to cover for it. They said, you, we're going to pay you money. You just make sure you tell everybody that the, the, the disciples come and stole his body. So no one ever in the first century 
denied that the tomb was empty. They just come up with a different story. So, historically speaking, Jesus rose from the dead. Aside from you know what we believe in our Orthodox Christianity, it's a historical fact that the tomb was empty, and that the people who seen him over 150 people uh, or 500 people one time, 120 on the day of Pentecost, still there uh, obeying his word. Uh, all these people seen him testify that he had risen from the dead, and that all the apostles was willing to die for that story. So we have all those things that give us a, a, a strong argument that the Resurrection took place. Now, since that took place, since we know that, we believe that, not just spiritually, but historically, we believe, we know that Jesus come out of that tomb. He presented himself alive. He ascended to the Father. It gives me hope that his promise that I will resurrect is true. I have that much more to stand on, that much more to believe. My faith is that much more solidified in the fact that I will rise again because he proved it by his own merit. Amen. So, this joy that we get from this is based on what Christ done. Christ rose. He proved it. He proved his power over death. He gives me the promise that that same power that he displayed over death, he's going to work it in me again. He's going to work it in me once again in resurrection. Over here in Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 16 and 17. Paul writes, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and reign shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I wanted to throw that last verse in there just because it's so good. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. In the time uh, of sorrow and distress and hardship, in the time when it looks like uh, our culture is getting more and more hostile toward our religion every single day, we can comfort each other with these words of joy and gladness that God will be faithful to do what God said He will do. He will raise us up. He will catch us up. We're going to be with it. There might be some stormy seas between here and there but he will be faithful because he proved it by his own resurrection by his own display of power over death all the blessings of God all that he gives us uh, in, in this life are just samples there's a greater thing coming they're all just samples to whet our appetite for the eternal blessings that we will enjoy in his presence forever in heaven Paul said if we don't have this hope if we're not holding to this if this isn't a reality to us that we will be resurrected and our hope is in this life only we are of all men most miserable because when Paul was writing that he was experiencing some hard things he was suffering he was given he was living in poverty and sickness given everything that he had he was living in, 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 in beatings imprisonments shipwrecks and robbers all these things that he was enduring for the gospel's sake he said if this is all there is it's a miserable life if there's no hope, if there's nothing to hold on to, if Christ isn't, didn't rise, if my home isn't in heaven, if I'm not going to be with my Lord eternally forever, then I'm my most miserable. See, it's, it's not enough. It's not enough just to, just to know, know Him now. I'm thankful for knowing Him now. That's not, that's not it. That's not enough. I want more. I want more than I can experience in this life. I want more than this body can handle. I want more than my carnal mind can understand. I want a greater experience with Christ that can only be realized as I'm resurrected from the dead and I'm living with Him eternally forever in His presence. That's, oh man, that's where I want to be. That's what I want to know. I want that. This isn't, this isn't all there is, as great as it can be. It's only an example. It's only a sample. It's only the weather appetite of what it's going to be whenever we're with Him, wherever we're in that country, wherever we're in His presence, whenever I see Him as He is, whenever I know as he's supposed to be known as I come in that presence and I come into that place where I was created to be there's so much more I'm so thankful for what there is but I'm, I'm not satisfied yeah. I am not satisfied here today That's right. Amen. I've never experienced anything in my life so great that I want to stay here That's right. Amen. 
Brother Clint Dennis said one time there was a book. This was an old tape I was listening to. It's like back in the eighties. He said there was a book to come out. Eighty-eight reasons why the Lord's going to come back in eighty-eight. Well, well, first of all, we know that's heretical. We know he didn't come back. But he said, well, one of the things that really got him in that, he said there was people who said, I hope you don't come back right now. I'm doing it better than I've ever done. I'm making more money than I've ever made. I've got a better life than I've ever had right now. I hope the Lord don't come back right now. Things are going too good. Now, that, that, that's, that's a man that don't know God. Yeah. That, that, that's, that's, that's a terror. Someone who thinks there's things are too good here to go be there. Oh, if we've got a glimpse of him. Yeah. If we felt his true presence, if my heart has been touched by Christ, there's nothing left in this world that can satisfy me anymore. Amen. My God, what the, the, the joy is as great as it can be that we can experience now and whatever it may have, whatever avenue that we find that joy, oh, it's just something small. It's something, it's something, uh, just a taste of what it's going to be that when we're there with Him. One of the greatest aspects and the greatest standards of joy in our lives now is the hope that we will be with Him forever. Amen. In our text, Jesus said that His flesh shall rest or abide in hope. Now, one definition of abide is to wait continually. And one writer said it was like this, and explained the abiding. He said it's like a tent. And the idea that as long as we're in this body, we will have hope in God that is promise uh, of resurrection. But like a tent, our hope is temporary. This is a temporary hope. This is a temporary hope that we hold to now, that we will be resurrected. A, a, a tent is just a temporary dwelling. It's not, nobody sees a tent and says, this is where this, this was the retirement home. This is where they want to stay. This is our home forever. It's a temporary. It's for one night. It's just something we're going to stay in for now. And this hope that we have, this abiding hope that we have in resurrection, it's a temporary hope because eventually it's going to be a realized hope. It's going to be, it's going to be culminated. It's going to be fulfilled. It's not going to be something that we're holding to and hoping for. At one time, it's going to be reality. It's going to be solidified. It's going to be where we live with Him forever in heaven. We're not going to be waiting anymore for resurrection. We are going to experience it. This promise of resurrection will soon be realized by the children of God. As the Lord's people, we should be filled with the certain hope of His coming and the resurrection of our bodies. We shall dwell with Him forever, eternally. Now such hope will fill us with joy and gladness. Amen. Only when we're ready to die are we ready to live. Yeah. Praise God forever. Only when we're ready to go there and be with Him are we ready to be useful to live in this life now. We can have true joy in this life only when we know that we will have eternal joy in the next life. Yeah. As a psalmist, he isn't just talking about a trickle of joy. He's not talking about uh, just a small amount of joy. He, in, in this life, he says that thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. Now, we shouldn't rest until the Lord fills us with his joy. Right. There's always more to be had. And he's saying, you know, we're not satisfied. We're looking to move beyond this. But even now, there's more to be had. There's more to be had. And it's something that it seems to, all we, as I'm studying lessons and, and, and speaking, is something that continually just keeps popping up. There's more. I think we've settled, as, as Pentecostals anyway, you know, we, we've settled for what it is to experience Christ. We've settled for what it is to have a good service. We've settled for what it is to, to know the Lord and, and to be Christians and to live in, in the knowledge of God. We've settled. And C.S. Lewis said we settle for so much less than what God wants us to have. There's more that we can experience. There's more that we can give. There's more that we can have of Christ if we'll just press in and seek after Him. He says that thou shalt make me full of joy with thy countenance. We shouldn't rest with just a trickle of joy. We shouldn't rest with just a drop of, of the presence of God, but we should continually press in to know Him more, to experience Him greater, and to be filled with the fullness of His joy. Now, um, I'm going to read a, a portion of a sermon by Jonathan Edwards called The Christian Pilgrim. And this, this excerpt is on the, the subject of joy. He says, God is the highest good of the reasonable creature. And the enjoyment of Him is the only happiness with which our souls can be satisfied. To go to heaven 
Fully to enjoy God is infinitely better than the most pleasant accommodations here. Fathers and mothers, husbands, wives, or children, or the company of earthly friends are but shadows. But the enjoyment of God is the substance. These are but scattered beams, but, the, but God is the sun. These are but streams, but God is the fountain. These are but drops, but God is the ocean. Therefore, it becomes us to spend this life only as a journey toward heaven. As it becomes us to make the seeking of our highest end and proper good the whole work of our lives to which we should sub subordinate all other concerns of life why should we labor for and set our hearts on anything else but that which is proper which is our proper end and true happiness Jesus Christ Amen. why should our why should our hearts be endeavored if there are anything else why shouldn't everything else just be a means in which to get to the end which is Christ God desires that we be full of joy and gladness. We'll find it only in Him. And we should aim for it, seek after it, and not rest until we enjoy a good measure of it. As we grow in God's joy, we, He will be glorified in our lives. Amen. Like Dr. John Piper says, God will be most glorified when we are most satisfied in Him. Yeah. When He is what we're satisfied with. And whenever He is so much greater than all the joys that this world has to offer, all the things that we sometimes place before Him, those things need to be identified. Those things need to be dragged out. Those things need to be mortified. Amen. Paul said, mortify the deeds of the flesh. Those, those things that sometimes we know to be good things, admirable things, nothing wrong with things. Sometimes those things get in the way of us experiencing the true joy of knowing Christ and being given unto Him. Amen. I have got done at 11 o'clock exactly. Amen. Amen. They know that's a feat for me around here. <laughs> Anybody have a question, testimony, comment, something to add this morning? I know last night me and Ricky was talking a little bit about, you know, when you want to experience Christ, really experience Him the, in the hunger that you have to know Him more, nothing else will ever satisfy you. Amen. I mean, not church, not just, you know, everyday life, you know, but it's different. It changes you. You've got a hunger that nothing else. Yeah. You don't ever get done looking for that or wanting more of that. And uh, I thank God for that. That you know, I'm not satisfied with just coming to church and you know, just, Amen. a little, you know. But I think I'm satisfied. Amen. Yes, Amen. You know, there, there's, there's no peace in, in, in sin. We know that. No peace in that. But then when we come to Christ. We experience the only place that there is peace, but there's also an unsettledness that we experience when we know God. We know that this isn't our home. We know this isn't all there is. We know that this flesh is foreign to what has been resurrected in my life, and I know that there's something better to come. Those things, and we read the Word of God, that, that's, that's validated. When we read it, God says that. Our spirit bears witness with it, but we know it. Whenever we come to know Him, we know that there's so much more than what we've just gotten into. Amen. Uh, the, the longer I go and the, the, the greater this thing becomes to me, the more anxious I am to experience more of Christ. Amen. 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 Anyone else have something good to say this morning? All right. Thank you all.